Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Sahachian, and I am one of the Director of Medical Affairs at Baxter Healthcare. I am pleased to have the privilege to introduce Dr. Heath Latham, Professor of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the University of Kansas Health System. Dr. Latham received his medical training at the University of Kansas School of Medicine and has been an integral part of the University of Kansas Health System since joining the Pulmonary and Critical Care Division in 2008. He became the Fellowship Director for the Pulmonary and Critical Care Program in 2013 and takes pride in enhancing the program and seeing the success of his graduating fellows. Much of his time in Kansas City is primarily spent in clinical service and educating students, residents, and fellows in the clinical setting. His focus involves working with the Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Fellows in the Medical Intensive Care Unit on inpatient pulmonary consults and in the outpatient pulmonary clinic. In 2020, Dr. Latham was asked to serve as the Medical Director of Health System Integration for the University of Kansas Health System. On a personal note, I have had the privilege of collaborating with Dr. Latham on several research projects, and he is an absolute pleasure to know. With that, I am pleased to hand the presentation over to Dr. Latham. Thank you, Jen, for that kind introduction. Um, it is a pleasure to be here to talk to everyone today. I certainly do wish uh, we could have been in Puerto Rico as I prefer to do discussions as everyone does uh, in person. These are gonna be the list of objectives that we hope to accomplish uh, today. I'm not gonna read those, um, but mainly we're just gonna talk about how perhaps utilization of a guided objective approach to volume resuscitation may be beneficial to our critically ill patients. So this is where being in person would be uh, typically a little bit better. Um, I like to carry this uh, case through my, uh, through my discussion and have some questions along the way. That doesn't really work in a, in a virtual format, but nonetheless, I do want to start with this case and want you to think about this one or one that's similar to this that you've taken care of as we talk through our discussion today. So AR is a real patient that I encountered several years ago. She's 72, she weighs 80 kilos. She was admitted to our emergency department from her care facility with a one day history of some altered mental status and fevers. She was hypo hypotensive on presentation, evidence of a UTI from a chronically indwelling Foley. She had multiple comorbidities with a history of an ischemic cardiomyopathy and a reduced EF of 20% chronic renal failure with a creatinine baseline around 2.4. She was given appropriate antibiotics and a 500 mil uh, bolus in the ED. She remained hypotensive, so they called us for admission. After that bolus, she remained febrile 39. Uh, her blood pressure you see there was 80 over 40. She was relatively tachycardic with a normal sinus rhythm, and she was tachypnic. She was requiring six liters of oxygen that's over her baseline of two liters. Our ED and us, when she got to us in the ICU, both did point of care ultrasound. We confirmed that she had a reduced left ventricular function. There was no pericardial or pleural effusions. There were no B lines and there was no pneumothorax as a potential contributing factor to her shock. So before we take a question as to what we would do next with her, I just wanna to touch base as to what our CMS guidelines are for our core measures in taking care of patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. So within three hours of identifying a patient as septic, we should measure a lactate. We should get our blood cultures before we give appropriate broad antibiotic coverage. coverage. And we should give about 30 mils per kg of crystalloid for those who are hypotensive or have a lactate greater than or equal to four. For those patients that remain hypotensive or have that high lactate, we should consider uh, getting vasopressors on board and we should do that before six hours and then reassessing their volume status again if that lactate is greater than four or they remain hypotensive and then remain, uh, remeasure that lactate if again it is high. So in 2021, our Surviving Sepsis Campaign uh, published the newest set of uh, guidelines. They continued to have this first uh, um, statement here of uh, severe sepsis or septic shock is a medical me emergency and treatment resuscitation should begin immediately. I think everyone listening and joining us today agrees that it's nice to see that sepsis is given the same time sensitive emergency statement as say MI or stroke or trauma. 
because even in sepsis, time is tissue. And the earlier we identify it, get antibiotics on board and get our fluids uh, resuscitation going, the better patients will be. There was a significant change, however, in the statement regarding the 30 mils per kg uh, of, of crystalloid. They used to have it as recommend and given high recommendation. This is now a we suggest recommendation of the 30 mils per kg within the first three hours and given a weak recommendation with low quality of evidence. And the reason behind that is because building um, evidence for guided resuscitation um, it, it is demonstrating that patients do well with guided resuscitation, not just a blanket 30 mils per kg for everyone. So let's talk back about our patient that I presented. So AR, she's now in our ICU. She's gotten that 500 mil bolus and antibiotics in the ED. So what is our next best step? Is it A, give two liters of fluid bolus or B, 500 mil fluid bolus? Is it C, assess for fluid responsiveness with dynamic measures to guide resuscitation? Is it D, start vasopressors or is it E, give Lasix? And I'll let you think about that for just a couple seconds. But given the fact that this is a discussion around fluid responsiveness and guided resuscitation, the appropriate next best step is to assess for fluid responsiveness with a dynamic measure and guide resuscitation. So before we move forward on that topic, let's first talk about where is this 30 mils per kg come from? And in essence, it all really starts around the three or four largest um, sepsis trials in the last two decades, starting with Rivers Early Goal Directed Therapy published in early 2000s, and then the three to assess for Early Goal Directed Therapy, um, effort, uh, whether or not Early Goal Directed Therapy um, was essential in our sepsis management in the Process, Promise, and Arise trials. In Rivers trial, patients had to get somewhere between 20 and 30 mils per kg, but in Process, Promise, and Arise, Patients basically needed to get one liter of fluid and appropriate antibiotics before they were randomized. So when you looked at those trials, basically the averages is where we come up with the 30 mils per kg. As you see here, prior to fluid, prior to randomization, on average, these patients in these large trials got right around 30 mils per kg. And it took right around three hours to randomize the patients. So this is where our three hour bundle comes from, and this is where that 30 mils per kg comes from. There is no randomized control trial to say 30 mils per kg is better than 20 or 40 or 25 or 35. It's really an averaging of very large trials looking at patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. So oftentimes when I do these uh, discussions with either my fellows or my colleagues or go and give talks like this, the question around 30 mils per kg is, well, is it safe in these at-risk patients, these at-risk patients with heart failure or who we think, man, we really don't want to give them extra fluid. And that's been looked into uh, very thoroughly by the uh, Surviving Sepsis uh, Campaign Group. And one of the best trials uh, to look at that is, uh, came out of um, uh, New York. Seymour and colleagues basically utilized the uh, New York State uh, Sepsis Registry. So all the hospitals have to submit their sepsis data um, to a registry in New York. So they looked at about 50,000 septic patients and they evaluated whether or not the effectiveness of timeliness of, get, of completing that three, three hour bundle had any effects on outcomes, namely looking at mortality. All these patients received 30 mils per kg within, within the th appropriate three hours. And so what they ultimately found was if all the components of that three hour bundle were um, done quicker, then the outcomes were better. Namely, mortality was better or lower. With the strongest predictor of an improved mortality is completing those antibiotics as soon as possible. And there was no risk of increase or adverse outcomes in the patients who had heart failure, chronic renal failure, or chronic respiratory failure at the time uh, of enrollment that received that 30 mils per kg. A different group, uh, group uh, Leisman and colleagues, uh, looked at data out of a nine hospital health system 
that all utilize the same resuscitation algorithm in their EDs around uh, sepsis. And they namely uh, broke it up as to, is there differences in outcomes when patients got fluids earlier than later? And namely, they, they broke it up to, did they get their fluids in less than 30 minutes, 31 minutes to two hours, or greater than two hours, or no fluids within six hours? And they specifically looked at whether or not uh, mortality was better. And what they demonstrated was that in people who got their 30 mils per kg earlier than later did have better outcomes, both in terms of mortality, as well as in their ICU and hospital lengths of stay. And then when they specifically looked at um, potential patient populations that are fluid sensitive, heart failure and renal failure, there was no significant adverse outcomes in those patients that got 30 mils for, uh, per kg of fluid either early or regardless of how much fluid that they did get in terms of mortality and mechanical need for mechanical ventilation. So 30 mils per kg is probably safe um, if that's uh, what is given to our septic patients when they arrive. And we should probably do it as soon as possible, again, as soon as we recognize that, just like getting fluids, or just like getting the antibiotics on board as soon as possible. So anytime uh, we take care of a patient, we should have goals. So anytime we take care of a shock patient, we should have goals for that resuscitation, i.e., what do we want to accomplish? Well, first and foremost, we want to achieve an adequate perfusion pressure. That just basically means we want to get that map to greater than 65. That may be with fluid, as we're talking about, maybe that's use of vasopressors, or in terms of a cardiogenic shock, that might be giving inotropes. And we wanna improve the patient's microcirculatory flow. That simply means we wanna know why that patient's in shock and then intervene uh, on the etiology of that shock. If the patient is having hemorrhagic shock, then we need to give them blood and we need to stop the hemorrhage. If they have septic shock, we need to identify the source of that sepsis, get appropriate antibiotics on board, and whatever needs to be done for source control. Cardiogenic shock for, let's say, an acute MI, we need to get perfusion uh, restored. So we improve that microcirculatory flow by knowing what the cause of the shock is and intervening appropriately. And then finally, we want to limit tissue edema. Regardless of the cause of the shock, we want to limit tissue edema so that does not contribute to any other adverse outcomes. What is interesting is that our first knee-jerk reaction when somebody presents with shock is to give them fluid, give them a bolus. But in reality, particularly in terms of sepsis uh, and septic shock, only about 50% of people are actually fluid responsive um, when they are given a bolus in severe sepsis and septic shock, meaning that you're not improving stroke volume or cardiac output. And if we're not giving fluid to improve stroke volume or cardiac output, then we shouldn't be giving it because we should think of fluid just like we think of any other drug. It has potential for adverse uh, effects. And therefore, if, it doesn't, if giving it isn't going to improve the stroke volume or cardiac output, therefore improve perfusion, then we shouldn't be giving that drug. We could spend an entire hour discussing all of the literature about the potential adverse effects of volume overload. There are multiple publications out there, I've put a few of them on here, that consistently demonstrate excess fluid in the critically ill lead to adverse outcomes, both in terms of more mortality as well as other morbidity in the hospital. Well, there are also uh, studies looking at whether or not a fluid conservative uh, approach uh, is also achievable and whether or not that can have adverse outcomes. Um, oftentimes, when I talk about fluid limit uh, based uh, strategies, the first questions that come up is, well, what about renal failure? because if we limit too much fluid to patients, they might go into renal failure. And renal failure is a number one predictor of uh, one-year mortality in the critically ill patients. And so this trial by Mayhoff and colleagues actually attempted to look at that, where they did a systematic review with meta-analysis, looking at randomized control trials since 2015 
in sepsis that looked at fluid volumes and limiting fluid liberal versus conservative strategy. There were overall 637 uh, patients utilized and or looked at in this meta-analysis. And all, all in all, there was no significant difference in all-cause uh, mortality in these trials in this meta-analysis. However, this is a pretty low number of subjects in a meta-analysis, and it was deemed to have pretty low quality uh, due to that quantity, and therefore a high risk for bias. So um, I would say that overall, fluid-limited approaches have never been shown to be uh, high risk for worsening mortality or morbidity but we don't have great data to support that just yet. So again, looking at our goals of resuscitation, ultimately we wanna limit tissue edema. So let's talk about the potential benefits of a guided resuscitation approach and how we can therefore hope to limit tissue edema in our resuscitation strategies. So in order to have a guided approach, we actually have to have tools for our assessments. CVP had long been looked at as potentially a way to help guide fluid res uh, resuscitation. This is really no better. It's just a static measure. And so whether it's CVP or uh, st other static pressure measurements from a PA catheter, these are not good measures and have consistently been shown not to be adequate to guide resuscitation. We need more dynamic assessments of uh, hemodynamics, and those can be obtained through ultrasound-based assessments or stroke volume surrogates. So our ultrasound-based assessments, yeah, we can look at IVC variability. Um, again, has a lot of the short, same shortfalls of CVP. We can use a much better Doppler-derived stroke volume surrogates. However, as we'll talk about a little bit later, these can have intra and inter-operator variability. Um, and you have to be really competent uh, to be confident in your use of these uh, surrogates. There are other devices, as we'll talk about a little bit later, that provide stroke volume uh, information. Now, those are either with bioreactants or pulse contour um, analysis. And then once we have something that's telling us uh, what a patient's stroke volume is, then we need to say, then we need to utilize that information to determine whether or not a patient is actually volume responsive. And there's two ways to go about that. There's what's termed the variability indices of stroke volume or pulse pressure uh, variation, and then what is just stroke volume change following a volume challenge. The variability indices are really dependent on the respiration-induced variation to stroke volume, meaning that patients have to be intubated on positive pressure ventilation. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. And if the patient is res fluid responsive, then they have a variability in stroke volume or pulse pressure greater than 12%. However, there's, as we'll talk about, limited applications across patient care uh, venues um, for variability indices to, indices to guide volume resuscitation. Stroke volume change, however, is independent of respiration meaning mechanical ventilation or not, or a patient's rhythm. And a patient is deemed responsive if their stroke volume changes by greater than or equal to 10% following some sort of volume challenge. And again, this could be true volume challenge with fluid or a passive leg raise, as we'll talk about here in just a bit. This has been shown to be applicable across a lot more uh, patient care uh, venues, as we'll discuss. So touching first on the variability indices, as I mentioned, it is dependent on the heart-lung interactions. The patients must be intubated, ventilated at a tidal volume of greater than or equal to eight mils per kg. They have to be passively ventilated, meaning they either need to be paralyzed or heavily sedated so they are not assisting the ventilator at all. They must be in sinus rhythm, but not too tachycardic. They must have compliant lungs, so patients with severe ARDS or dense pneumonias are not going to be candidates uh, for variability indices. And that's representative by this need for a heart rate to respiratory rate ratio to be greater than 3.6 in order for the variability indices to be accurate. I really like this diagram by Machard and Taboul. 
in which they've basically put the physiologic effect, effects on right ventricular and left ventricular hemodynamics over a pressure time ventilatory curve that you see right here. And so when uh, a mechanical ventilated breath is started, what this does is it impedes venous return, therefore decreasing right ventricular preload. And at the end of inspiration, the right ventricular stroke volume will be at its lowest. Meanwhile, that same breath has Im improved left ventricular preload by pushing blood out of the lungs into the left side of the heart. Thus, at the end of inspiration, the left ventricular stroke volume is going to be at its highest, so will pulse pressure. And then as that, as that breath releases towards end uh, expiration, this right ventricular low stroke volume is now in the left heart and the left ventricular stroke volume will be at its lowest. And the variability of that breath to breath changes in our stroke volume or our pulse pressure, again, being greater than 12% indicating responsiveness, can help guide fluid resuscitation if all the pro, uh, parameters are actually met. And so this was actually looked at and published in 2013 in the uh, British Journal of Anesthesia, in which on one day in 26 ICUs across Europe, um, patients were observed as to whether or not they met all these criteria for variability indices to be accurate. So these patients had to have an art line in place, for looking at either stroke volume or pulse pressure variability. 311 patients were identified in these 26 ICUs that had an art line in place to look at variability indices, but only 2% met all the criteria for looking at variability indices to be accurate. So therefore, this is not a very good applicable uh, use of a tool across ICUs. It's very good in the OR or those that are heavily sedated or paralyzed, but in the day-to-day -day care of patients that we really want to know whether or not they're fluid responsive, it's less likely to be a good, uh, a good surrogate for volume responsiveness. Again, limited applications of these variability indices limited to the OR or the deeply sedated or the paralyzed. However, stroke volume changes um, with volume challenges are more applicable across all venues of ICU, OR, etc. But in order to look at changes in stroke volume, we need technology as alluded to before. We will talk about bioreactants, Doppler-derived or pulse contour-derived analysis. And then we need a challenge technique. The gold standard is given a fluid bolus of crystalloid over, of about 500 mils over at least 30 minutes. Or you can use passive leg raise as a surrogate to actually giving volume. And we'll talk about the passive leg raise next. So basically the passive leg raise is a reversible uh, technique for a volume expansion of about 300 mils. You basically take a patient in a semi-recumbent position lay them flat in a supine position and elevate their legs for maybe around three minutes and assess for changes in that stroke volume. You do wanna be cautious. So patients with very labile hemodynamics, you would not want to do a passive leg raise or patients with tenuous respiratory status, whether they're on a ventilator or not on a ventilator. That patient with severe ARDS, we've all encountered during the COVID era, that every time you walk by the room and just look at them, they desat. That's not a patient you want to um, you want to do any passive leg raises on. But many of patients meet criteria that would be very safe for them to do passive leg raise, whether they're intubated or not. So Caviaro uh, and colleagues uh, basically did a meta analysis uh, and published back in 2010 of nine articles or 366 uh, pooled interventions of patients in shock in various ICUs settings and assessed whether or not um, improvements in their cardiac or stroke volume indices um, via passive leg raise were a good surrogate for a fluid challenge to predict fluid responsiveness. These patients had uh, mixed ventilation, some ventilated, some not, some assisting ventilation, some not, mixed rhythms, and ultimately the passive leg raise was deemed to be accurate to predict fluid responsiveness. 
and looking at changes in stroke volume index or cardiac index was superior to pulse pressure variation in, det in determining fluid responsiveness. Again, due to all of those other uh, criteria needed to um, have a variability industry indice for pulse pressure variation to be accurate is the reason this was more accurate than uh, looking at pulse pressure variation. This is the data uh, from Caballero's uh, um, meta-analysis. Uh, I just point this out because again here only about 50% of patients uh, given boluses were actually fluid responsive and the area under the receiver operating curve for a passive leg raise to be a good surrogate for fluid uh, determining fluid responsiveness was very high at uh, 0.95. So let's talk about the technologies uh, to assess uh, stroke volume and therefore changes in stroke volume. So first will be bioreactants. This is a completely non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring uh, technology in which electrodes are placed on the uh, thorax as you see here. Through those electrodes, um, a, a known current is passed and then the device assesses for changes in that, uh, uh, in that current as a result of basically cardiac outflow, known as phase delay. And as a result of that, then a stroke volume uh, is produced and displayed on the machine for you to look at and therefore assess hemodynamics. This device and technology is not affected by spontaneous breathing or the patient moving and updates on a very routine basis for uh, ongoing assessment. It's been tested in a multitude of uh, settings. It's not affected by external electronics and it can be used in a non-physician algorithm. And what I mean by that or a non-provider algorithm is that nurses could be resuscitating patients based on protocols as opposed to needing to call the patient or the physician or the provider to get orders. So in our ICU, we have a resuscitative, resuscitation protocol for stroke volume uh, guided resuscitation. So our, our nurses will place uh, um, the bioreactants um, um, electrodes on and they start a resuscitation. This may be with passive leg raise or it may be with uh, repeated fluid uh, boluses. And if the patient continues to be fluid responsive, i.e. their stroke volume improves by 10% or greater um, with every volume challenge, then they continue to resuscitate that patient until they are no longer fluid responsive or they've reached uh, two liters of fluid resuscitation, then they contact uh, the physician. So patients can get resuscitated in a very short amount of time with again, out uh, physician or APPs being at the bedside or called after every intervention. With any technologies, there are potential for uh, limitations. So these electrodes that are placed don't last forever. Um, however, they do tend to uh, last a good 48, 72 hours. Um, generally speaking, all the resuscitation for patients is done with, typically within the first 24 hours. Consistent with all the other technologies, uh, looking at pulse contour analysis, et cetera, um, it can be inaccurate in severe uh, valvular abnormalities such as aortic insufficiency or big thoracic aneurysms, or if there's devices in place that take away cardiac, uh, the pulsatility of cardiac outflow such as balloon pumps or LVADs, uh, impellers, et cetera. In terms of pulse contour analysis, these utilize uh, an art line that, are, that is in place. And basically the area under the arterial tracing, uh, the, it, the first two thirds is really the systolic portion of um, arterial outflow from the heart. And the area under that curve is plugged into proprietary algorithms and a stroke volume number is then produced from these devices. Generally, these all have presumed constants of vascular compliance or aortic impedance and the pulmonary vascular resistance. However, the more accurate and the more they are more accurate if the pulse is very regular um, in terms of um, no arrhythmias for the most part. Again, advantages 
generally simple to use. They utilize the art line that's already in place, provide real-time data in that they do update um, in short periods of time. These two can be used in non-provider-based resuscitation protocols. However, the biggest disadvantages is that um, they do require excellent waveforms to be accurate. We've all placed that art line and then the patient bends the wrist and they, all of a sudden that art line tracing is dampened and therefore the um, accuracy of the devices could then therefore go down. Some devices require recalibration on a routine basis. Others uh, are auto calibrating, which raise question of accuracy in certain clinical settings, uh, particularly if they're on high um, vasopressors. And again, yes, they will provide stroke volume variability, but we've also uh, already discussed that the limitations of the variability indices um, for accuracy in ICU-based settings. How about Doppler-derived stroke volume? So there's been a significant increase uh, in the use of point-of-care ultrasound, uh, both in the emergency departments as well as in the ORs and in the ICUs. And we can all use Doppler um, on point-of-care ultrasound, therefore looking for uh, stroke volume surrogates either out of the left ventricular outflow tract or carotid arteries or femoral arteries for peripheral artery-based Doppler and stroke volume surrogates. There are standalone uh, Doppler devices for esophageal Doppler or the USCOM device to use, uh, assess for stroke volume and therefore changes in stroke volume as well. One of the advantages of point of care ultrasound or bedside ultrasound is that it's not only can be used for looking for fluid responsiveness, but you can utilize the data from it to assess for the cause of the shock, assessment for what happens after volume responsive, uh, uh, or not volume responsiveness, or the therapeutic uh, effect of whatever intervention you've done uh, for the cause of the shock. However, the disadvantages really come to the availability of the ultrasound and depending on where you, where you work um, or perhaps even then where you trained as to whether or not you had a lot of training for the use of point of care ultrasound. And that's probably the biggest disadvantage in the inter and intra operator uh, variability um, um, in terms of the competence and then how you get the data out of that. Um, so also because these devices, there's no continuous measurement, you need to use the device to assess for uh, stroke volume. You cannot use this in non-provider-based uh, uh, resuscitation uh, protocols. So is fluid-limited care or fluid-limited strategies realistic? A single center uh, study looking at this um, from Colliff, uh, Marion Colliff and colleagues, uh, basically randomized 82 septic shock patients into what was deemed usual care versus a targeted fluid therapy where they would resuscitate patients based on uh, various clinical data and then conservative uh, fluid strategies to limit fluid after fluid resuscitation had been achieved. You can see here that a fluid limited strategies did have significantly lower net fluid balances at day threes and five. And there was no significant adverse uh, effects on mortality, need for renal replacement therapy, ventilator days, or more vasopressors in the two strategies. So yes, fluid conservative strategies is achievable and does not appear to increase patients' adverse outcomes in a fluid limited approach. So, if we have technology that can provide us with the information needed to know who is fluid responsive and therefore can have an objective approach to resuscitating uh, patients in a fluid uh, or guided approach, then what we can do is identify patients who are truly fluid refractory because it's those patients that we want to identify because those are the patients that are at risk of adverse effects of excess volume. And those are the patients that will probably benefit if they're still shocky by starting vasopressors sooner. These can then be titratable to achieve our goal of getting that map of greater than 65. 
This will help us uh, reduce the risk of excess volume of just giving fluids to give fluids um, in thinking that that will get us to our goal map when in fact the patient may not be fluid responsive, i.e. fluid refractory. We know that these vasopressors are safe. We know that doing guided approach is safe in sepsis. And there's building evidence that earlier vasopressors may also be uh, beneficial, particularly in our septic shock patients. So are there any other potential benefits of guided resuscitation to our patients besides just is there mortality benefit, et cetera? And the answer to that is I think so, yes. So our group, we looked retrospectively in our ICUs in patients that presented with severe sepsis and septic shock over a six month time, uh, time period. This was a six month time period in which we had bioreactance devices to guide stroke volume resuscitation. So we looked at patients who had stroke volume guided resuscitation by the bioreactance device versus those that didn't. We termed them usual care with a hypothesis that would be those patients that got a, a guided resuscitation would have uh, ultimately get less fluids. And that is in fact what we showed. So in patients that got guided resuscitation in this graph is represented by the red line, they, got, they had a significantly lower net fluid balance than the usual care group in the blue line by 24 hours at 48 hours and by the end of their ICU length of stay. But more than having uh, getting less fluids or having a, a lower net fluid balance, there were other significant uh, findings in that these patients were less likely to have uh, or require mechanical ventilation at 30% versus 57%. Uh, percent. They were on vasopressors a significantly less amount of time, 32 hours versus 65 hours. These two things most likely contributed to the shorter ICU length of stay of six days versus nine days. And unexpectedly, um, patients were less likely to require acute hemodialysis if they got stroke volume guided resuscitation at 6% versus 19% in the usual care group. In, a, in our multivariate analysis of the data, uh, stroke volume guided approach was an independent predictor of a lower net fluid balance during their ICU stay, a decreased length of stay in the ICU, need for mechanical ventilation, as, out, as well as a shorter duration of uh, vasopressors. So this data was very interesting to the critical care community and a prospective multi-center randomized control trial called the FRESH uh, trial uh, was undertaken and was published in CHEST in 2020 in which 124 septic patients that were uh, continued to have uh, refractory shock despite one to three liters of crystalloid were randomized to a stroke volume guided resuscitation approach with passive leg raise versus usual care, with the primary outcome being what is the mean fluid balance and would that be less in the, in the guided approach. That is what was shown. The stroke volume guided uh, group got significantly less uh, net fluid, mean fluid balance at 1.4 liters versus usual care. And there were significant secondary outcomes consistent with the data that we showed as well in that patients were less likely to require acute hemodialysis at five versus nearly 18% or require mechanical ventilation at 18% versus 34%. And patients in the stroke volume guided resuscitation group were more likely to be discharged home 64% versus 34% um, um, as well. So again, not only do patients get less fluid, but have Im overall improved um, other outcomes. And again, hemo less hemodialysis. And hemodialysis, again, is a significant predictor of one year mortality in the critical care groups. So what's the impact of this fresh trial in our septic patients? Well, first and foremost, the use of passive leg rage guided stroke volume assessment for fluid responsiveness is it was demonstrated to be safe. 
It overall resulted in a lower net fluid balance, need for mechanical ventilation, and reduced the risk of renal failure requiring hemodialysis, thus supporting the use of dynamic assessment measures to guide fluid resuscitation, being an important way by which we could care for our septic patients and hopefully improve their overall uh, outcomes. And like, like was shown, a trend towards di uh, discharging more of those patients home. I want to kind of end here by going back to this concept around the 30 mils per kg. So if we have technology and the tools to do a stroke volume guided resuscitation, then just giving 30 mils per kg to every patient does not seem to be very patient centric. And therefore, I think we have to really start thinking as to whether or not 30 mils per kg as a guideline for everyone is really the way to go. So we in our group did retrospectively look back at some ED patients that presented uh, to, to our hospital with uh, sepsis and septic shock. And they had a sepsis response team uh, come and do basically a stroke volume guided resuscitation response to them. So we found 120 uh, patients that met criteria for septic shock that got stroke volume guided assessments and resuscitation. Interestingly, 63% of those patients were, were volume responsive at the first assessment. So even patients presenting in shock to an ED, their first uh, fluid challenge or passive leg raise challenge, only 63% of them were actually fluid responsive. So not even, even right out of the gate, not everyone is fluid responsive. And then we divided these patients into those that fluids were stopped short of the 30 mils per kg based on stroke volume data and those that continued to get uh, fluid despite what stroke volume data was available. And we when we looked at these two groups, so 50 in the fluid stopped group versus 70 in the uh, physician preference uh, group that continued to get resuscitated, patients in the, in, in the fluid stopped group got a significantly less uh, total volume of IV fluids um, within three hours versus the other group, which equated to 20 mils per kg versus the 30 mils uh, per kg in the physician preference group. There was no significant difference in other outcomes. These patients tend, tended to get more uh, vasopressors, but tended to get them for a shorter duration and there was no significant difference uh, in, the, in the need for mechanical ventilation, dialysis, or their uh, hospital uh, length of stay or mortality. But overall, the numbers um, were overall low. So again, I think more data um, and investigation is needed into this concept around the 30 mils per kg. So in conclusion, there is mounting evidence of the potential harm for excess volume loading in our critical care patients, um, not only in terms in mortality, but other secondary outcomes of morbidity, which may be ICU length of stay, discharge to um, care facilities, and other uh, potential complications. We now have the technologies to do stroke volume guided resuscitation, both in terms of um, um, both in terms of how we can utilize these technologies, as well as either giving boluses of fluid or utilizing uh, passive leg raise as surrogates to bolus to again further limit any excess volume, so that we can focus on early and optimal fluid resuscitation in order to prevent late fluid excess or, and therefore volume overload. And given that we do have this access to technology and we can identify those patients who are fluid refractory, who won't benefit from excess or giving additional volume, then I think we need to really think about whether or not um, 30 mils per kg is the right answer for everyone because we want to take a true patient-centered approach in facilities that do have 
the resources to do guided resuscitation. I will end with one last comment that I come from a very small rural community in Northwest Kansas. And out there, the hospitals do not have technologies to do stroke volume guided approach. So if you don't have the technology to do stroke volume guided approach, and if my, patient, if my parents present to our local hospital out there, the best evidence is that they will get their 30 mils per kg um, and get early antibiotics in hopes that those early interventions will help them recover from their um, sepsis or septic shock. However, if my, my parents are visiting me here in, in Kansas City and they go to my hospital at the University of Kansas, I hope that they get a stroke volume guided approach so that if they don't need any additional fluid, they don't get any additional fluid so that they can limit any excess fluid that they don't need and just do a guided and patient-centered approach. I certainly appreciate your attention today and it was a pleasure to be here to talk to you. Thank you very much.